Back America, I'm Hugh Hewitt. David Rubenstein is the New York Times bestselling author of How to Lead, other great books, The American Experiment. He's the co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlyle Group, one of the famous uh, investment groups in the United States. David has a new book out, How to Invest, that is deeply invested in financial literacy. And I really want people to listen up here because if you get this right at the beginning of your life, by the end of your life, you'll be secure. David, good morning. How are you? Oh, David, good morning. How are you? How are you? I am great. I love how to invest because it's all about financial literacy. If I can begin on page 63 with okay. uh, John W. Rogers. First of all, would you tell people who John W. Rogers is? He's, it's a fascinating interview you did with him, but he's also got a, an amazing backstory. John W. Rogers is an African-American who went to Princeton, captain of the basketball team, two years after graduating from Princeton, started the first African or the what is now the largest African-American investment company in the United States, Ariel Capital. It's now co-CEO'd by him and Melody Hobson. Uh, now, I got to tell you, when you asked him, weren't you a little bit young to start your own financial investment firm? He responded, my father bought stocks for me every birthday and every Christmas after I was 12. By the time I was 24, I had 12 years of experience making a lot of mistakes before I started Ariel, which is his firm. Uh, David Rubenstein, Dads who teach their kids about investing are really doing a service to them. I am deeply concerned at the financial illiteracy in our country. Well, I agree. Um, right now, many people don't really understand the difference between a stock and a bond, and many people don't learn anything about business uh, very early. And, and now many people have uh, pension funds and 401ks, and they don't really know what they're doing with it, and sadly um, – point I wanted to make, though, about the book is that those people that are good investors are really helping our country, because by allocating capital in an appropriate way, you can make the country better. For example, the venture capitalists who started uh, and gave money to Moderna did a really good job um, helping a, start a company that was going to, you know, that ultimately provided the vaccine that we needed. So I think uh, people who are wealthy people that invest may be criticized by some for making a lot of money, but the truth is they give the bulk of the money away. And secondly, they're actually doing something good for the country by allocating capitals and capital in ways that makes the country better, in my view. I, I like to remind people as well, it was joint stock companies that got America started in Virginia and Plymouth Plantation. That's All <laughs> joint stock companies. David, let's talk about your first investment. In a futures contract that the Colts would beat the Jets in the Super Bowl in 1969. <laughs> I, I can't believe that was your last sports bet, but I, I love the line in there. That was your last sports bet. It's what do you true. think about the rise of online gaming and the rather casual disappearance of millions of dollars every weekend from middle-income investors' lives? Well, I, I have not actually bet on another sports thing since then. I'd resolved never to do it again, and I haven't. But, but the truth is, um, if people enjoy um, betting, um, I don't say it's, a, it's a necessarily a sin for them to do it by getting some enjoyment from it. It isn't something I would enjoy, but... But I, I do think some of the money could be better spent in other ways. And I think some people probably put too much in to betting. In other words, if you spend uh, half of 1% of your net worth on betting each year and you lose it, it's not the end of the earth. You spend 10 or 20% on it, you can really hurt your family and your children. Uh, you know, David, I always tell people Las Vegas isn't built. They don't build anything there. They don't make it. Las Vegas exists because people go there and leave their money behind. If those people invested it and ways that you discuss and how to invest where we're going right now, they'd be a lot better off. It comes down to being a good investor. David Rubenstein's notes on investing is the very first chapter. Uh, don't count on good luck. Uh, good luck can actually be bad luck if it occurs too early. I like you quoting Jim Baker's father. Prior preparation prevents poor performance because uh, Peter Baker did that biography of Jim Baker. Right. And I learned that that is his mantra. Boy, does that apply to investing. That's true. I mean, if you really prepare for anything, you can do reasonably well. Certainly prepare. It helps in investing. The best investors in our country do a lot of work. It's not luck just sitting in front of a screen and just guessing to buy this stock or that stock. They really do invest. They really do research, and they know what they're doing. Uh, David, I never give investment advice because um, I'm not a professional. I'm a broadcaster and a lawyer. You're a professional. What do you make about people? You actually declaim against it in the book who just decide they're going to go to Robin Hood and, and guide their own investments? Well, it's a fool's errand to some extent. I mean, I think 
the truth is it, you should probably use somebody that knows what they're doing. I mean, if you were a good athlete, you wouldn't just all of a sudden expect somebody who's a financial person to be a good athlete. It takes preparation. You have to really know what you're doing. And as a general rule in life, people that know what they're doing and are reasonably intelligent will do better than people that don't know what they're doing and are not that intelligent. So find people who are hardworking, know what they're doing, and they can advise you. That's my view. And you can try. It's also the view of Larry Fink, Ron Barron. A lot of these people that you talk to about the basic baskets of investments, cash, bonds, stock, and real estate, again and again, they tell you there are experts out there. Do not go off on flyers. I'm going to get to crypto eventually, but let's start with cash. David, people can't hold cash now, can they? It's, it's, it's going to lose 10% a year in its value. Well, because of inflation, you will probably lose money. That's correct. So cash is not something that is a great asset right now because inflation's so high. You need to get a better return than the inflation rate. Larry Fink tells you the most common mistake being made right now, you offer it up to him, is it, uh, are they investing in too much, one thing, or are they relying on headlines? Fink picks headlines and says, they may be making that mistake right now. We get accustomed to an economic environment. We assume that environment will last forever. First question, how much do you let the day-to-day -day news cycle impact your investments? Well, it doesn't affect me that much because I'm in the long-term business. But obviously, you don't like seeing headlines about the stock market going down. But the truth is the biggest mistake that investors generally make is when markets are going up, they rush in to buy stocks. And when markets are going down, they rush to sell what they have. That's the opposite of what you should do. Right now, markets are depressed. There's no doubt about it. But markets always come back in this country. And if you hold on for a while, you'll avoid the transaction costs and the taxes associated with selling things. So I think it's better not to look at the newspaper headlines every, every half hour and worry about the markets going up and down. Warren Buffett is not sitting there worrying about the stock market going up and down. conversation which surprised i think you it surprised me he manages his own money uh larry fink has got this this enormous uh, uh, armada of analysts and right. yet he makes his own choices with his own money what does that tell you david well he's a smart guy he's got really good people it's a little bit misleading to say he's managing his own money he's got the best people in the world helping to advise him so he's basically i think look listening to these advisors and kind of telling them what to do with his money. But they're, he's based, basing what he's doing based on the really good information they have. Ron Barron tells you a similar thing about not buying and selling. He also tells you on page 59 that an unnamed person told him, don't worry about earnings per share. They make up those numbers. Worry about sales. Do you agree with that? Well, to some extent, I mean, earnings per share will drive a stock market, stock price. But, you know, if a company's got really good revenues, eventually earnings will come around, as Jeff Bezos proved. You know, people made fun of him for a while not having enough earnings, and then eventually he got enough market share that he could he could make some earnings out of it. So earnings per share is a little bit misleading. And also, you should recognize that if you have a lot of revenue, eventually you will get earnings. Uh, let's also talk, uh, David Rubenstein, about John Gray, Chief Operating Officer at right. Blackstone. I love the fact that he began – in real estate because he just heard someone say, what do you think? And those, someone happened to be Steven Schwartzman. Right. So that's a good person to say, okay, I'll take your nod. I, I think the most important words anyone ever hears, have, have you ever considered, and I know a guy because they're invitations to do something. Do you think many people would have taken the choice he did to go into the new real estate group at Blackstone when he was a youngster? Probably not, but he went into it. And as the story unfolded, he built the largest single real estate business in the, in the world, and it now has about $250 billion in a management at Blackstone, and he rose up to now be the president of Blackstone. So he did very well, but he, he did, worked hard over 25, 30 years to build that real estate business. And I want people to go back to when he gets the offer. I was mostly running numbers, doing pitch book for clients and ordering dinner. I had to make sure the associates got their food by 7 p.m., uh, he started humble. He's now running the largest real estate investment right. firm in the world. That is not an uncommon story in the pages of how to invest, David. Right. I think humility is a good virtue. Obviously, uh, there's some investors that maybe brag a little bit too much. But generally, the most of the people that I interviewed were people that made losses, had mistakes, had things not work out. And they learned a lot from it. And they learned a lot about humility. Warren Buffett isn't running around saying, I'm the greatest investor in the world. He just lets his actions speak for himself. The, uh, the quote I took away from John Gray, best investment advice he ever received, be a high conviction investor. When you see something, single family housing, global right. logistics, the movement of everything online, you lean into that and that's when you have the best outcomes. 
explain how you view uh, high conviction investing. Well, that's a, a rule that George Soros also had over the years, too, which is if you have a really, really good idea and you really know what you're doing, don't just then say asset allocate a little bit to it. Really put a fair amount of money into it because it's rare that great ideas come along. When you have a great idea and you really are high, have a high conviction about it, put your assets into that. Uh, I, in the conversation, you just made me think of Michael Moritz, former journalist, partner at Sequoia from Wales, a Jew from Wales. You don't run into many of those. Uh, he always, he said to you, we always thought it was rarely ever too late to get into a good investment. I think that's profound. You want to expand on that? Yes. I mean, if it's a good investment, you know, you may not be there on the ground floor, but it's still a good company. So sometimes uh, his company, Sequoia, which is the leading venture capital firm in the United States now, they, they come in not in the first round necessarily or the seed round, but they come in the second and third or fourth round, but they're still getting in at good prices because it's a good company and good companies will ultimately get to a really good value. Uh, David Rubenstein, you also asked Moritz about how do people get to make a pitch to Sequoia? He says they get about a thousand inquiries a year and they do 10 deals. So what do you, that's generally got to be Carlisle's position as well. How do you well, pick which ones to go deep into when they're, everyone is pitching you? Well, you get lots of stuff over the transom. And after a while, you have experience in what is really a waste of time and what is really going to be meaningful. And then when you meet the people who are running the, the idea of the company, you can determine whether they have some experience, whether they know what they're doing, whether they have the hunger and the drive and the intellect to push it through. And that's what, it, that's what you're paying for when you invest with a venture firm is their judgment. But, you know, it's, it's not rarely – it's rarely the case that somebody has a great idea, has a great talent, and, and venture capital investors are going to pass on that. They, they know what they're doing generally. Now, in the book, you ask uh, one of your – I think it's Ron. Uh, if I have $100,000, what should I do with it? And he doesn't answer by beginning what I thought he should have said. It depends on where you are in life. If you're a qualified investor, that's a completely different question than if it's your only $100,000, isn't it? Right. Of course. If well, it's only uh, $100,000, go safety and go growth long term. But if it's 100000 you can afford to lose, what do you have him put it into now, David Rubenstein? Well, if it, you can afford to lose it, then obviously you can take a higher risk. And if you're trying to get a higher rate of return, it depends on what your, your status is in life. If you're retired, $100,000 means a lot to you. you. You need to get a solid return, and you're not going to lose that 100000 Not losing your principal is one of the most important rules of investment. Don't lose what you already have. If you're really young and, and willing to take big risks, sure, you can take some venture capital flyers or, or some startup flyers. But as a general rule of thumb, for most people, losing money is not a good thing, and you should take that pretty safe, prudent course. I want to go to Mark Anderson. Uh, you ask him about China. He is very clipped. We don't invest much there. Generally speaking, I see American capital uh, withdrawing from the China market. Do you agree with that assessment, David? It's not moving in very much right now, and it's very difficult to invest there right now. So for the time being, most American investors that I'm familiar with who have money there would like to get it out uh, on a reasonable profit basis. They're not rushing to sell everything because it's not easy to sell everything. But right now, it's more challenging to invest in China than it was 10 years ago. There's no doubt about it. How to Invest, David Rubenstein's new book, also has chapters on cryptocurrency, SPACs, infrastructure, ESG. I'm going to talk about that now, David, because it interests some people. But I have in my hand this morning's Financial Times. Retail investors warned on piling into risky alternative product. Asset managers cite pitfall at, at Finance Times conference as alts look beyond institutions for growth. I think that's a very wise caution, David. What do you think about that? Well, right now, I'd say that retail investors are generally people that are not that sophisticated, they're not that experienced, and they should really follow good managers and try to not lose their money and diversify. So if you're a retail investor, I would probably go into things that are more traditional, stocks and bonds, know what you're doing. You can allocate a little bit of what you have, maybe 5 or 10% into the so-called alternatives, but make sure you know what you're doing and invest with really good people. Uh, David, let's talk about cryptocurrency. My advice, and I've been doing this show since 19, since 2000, 23 years. And when cryptocurrencies arrived, I said, don't buy anything you don't understand. I still tell people, don't buy anything you don't understand. But a lot of people like to gamble on cryptocurrency. I don't. It's a fundamental departure from sound investing unless you can afford to lose that money. Well, if you go to Las Vegas and you're smart, you know you're going to probably lose whatever you take with you because that's what Las Vegas is about. 
So if you get the pleasure out of gambling, it's, a, it's, a, it's like going out to a good restaurant for you or going to a sporting event. If you get pleasure out of it and you can afford to lose 1% of your or 2% of your net worth, then you, then you can invest in crypto and you'll still lose 1% or 2% perhaps. But you, you, know, you get the pleasure out of saying, I invested in crypto, watch the screens and so forth. But if you really are trying to make large sums of money and know what you're doing, it's not, it's not easy to do in crypto. It can be a fool's errand. It can't, it's very well explained in how to invest. As our SPACs, as our infrastructure plays, but I want to conclude, David, by talking about ESG. Uh, I think it stands for evading scrutiny of governments, but a lot of people believe in it. This morning, also in the Financial Times, uh, former Deputy Treasury Secretary Sarah Bloom Raskin uh, warns about ESG distorting markets. What do you think about her warning? I think ESG has gotten uh, to the point where people are so obsessed with it that they ignore whether the underlying investment is as good as they as it should be so esg is a factor to be taken into account but don't ignore the underlying quality of the company you're investing in and the and the economic situation you're investing in and i think esg is now coming under some attack for people saying that people are focused only on esg and not the quality of the investment i i want to conclude by talking to you about outliers I'm trying to find the exact quote, and I think it came in your conversation uh, with Moritz. It might have come in your in your conversation with John Gray. I'm not sure, or or maybe Mark Anderson. Somebody said the outliers are where you make the money. Has uh, that been Carlisle Group's view? Generally, uh, great investors go against conventional wisdom. That's where you you pr- perform what other people are. You go where other people are not going. Carlisle is a more traditional investment firm, and we tend not to take undue risks. So we tend to go with more conventional kinds of things. But there are firms that are much more on the outer edge than we are, venture firms or, 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 or firms that do uh, seed investing. That's not what, what has been our forte generally. We tend to be more conventional in what we do, more bread and butter kind of things. All right, let me let me close by thanking you for hiring Glenn Youngkin whenever you did that. I assume okay. you were part of the decision to hire our governor. Well, I, lo- I hired him 20, 25 years ago. I recruited him to Carlisle, yes. Isn't that, that, that's terrific. Did you ever see in him a future governor of Virginia and possible presidential candidate? Well, I, uh, you know, didn't when I first hired him, I didn't. But uh, now I do. So you never know. Uh, I, it's, it's interesting. A lot of politicians go into finance, but very few financiers go into politician. That's, Am I right about correct. that? Glenn so, is a very talented person. When you hire for Carlisle, when you're looking for the future great investors who will be interviewed by a future David Rubenstein for the 30 years down the road book, How to Invest in 2050, what do you look for in a young person who wants to go to work for you? I want intelligence, drive, um, humility, a willingness to do something to help the country at some point with some free time or free money they might have, and somebody wants to give back to society. But I'm looking for somebody that's like actually has a drive with them and they really want to do something with their life, not just make money. Uh, So last question, Michael Moritz had no financial background. He's a journalist. He's become a brilliant investor. Do you have to have quantitative skills to get hired at Carlisle? No, I don't have them myself. Um, I have (laughs) no quantitative skills. I'm a lawyer by training. No, we're looking for people that, that are smart, have accomplished something and that really want to work hard to make something of themselves and to enjoy the game of investing with the idea that what you're doing in investing is helping to build the country, helping countries, companies get stronger. And that's what we're looking for. You know, you can teach people math and, and, and quantitative skills in a relatively short period of time if, you, if they need to learn that skill. That is my view. I agree with you completely. That's why I liked How to Invest. David, thank you for your time. I think you got another New York Times bestseller on it. Be well.